That was amazing. I haven't actually heard that new intro music just yet, so that was glorious. This is KHTS News Director Jade Abishan, and I'm here today with California Assemblywoman Suzette martinez Valadares, who represents the Santa Clarita Valley. How are you doing today, Suzette? Hi, Jade. I am doing wonderful. Um, Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Feliz Navidad. Kwanzaa. Happy New Year. Good to hear from you. Good to hear from you as well. Yes, it is the holidays. It is getting to the end of the year, and we have so much to talk about. I know we had a little bit of trouble trying to figure out exactly what to talk about. But this is your (laughs) first full year in office. Let's do a little bit of a wrap-up. First things first, you've been helping deal with kind of the absolute disaster that has been a lot of our public safety power shutoffs, which have now happened for several years in a row as of last Thanksgiving, where we had multiple people who were out of power over Thanksgiving and couldn't cook their turkeys. What have you been doing to kind of help people out there? Yeah, you know, as you mentioned, it's been a year. Actually, December 7th um, was my official year um, of having been sworn in to represent the 38th Assembly District. And I think we had this conversation before, you know, when I was being sworn in, I was walking into Golden One by myself because, you know, we were still at the height of the pandemic and we weren't being sworn in on the assembly floor. And I was getting, you know, text messages from the district, from staff and from SoCal Edison about public safety power shutoff. So literally, you know, talk about hitting the ground running on an issue um, public safety power should have, have continued to be, you know, a huge problem for our community. And the 38th Assembly District has a lot of rural areas. You know, I've been working really close with the California Public Utilities Commission, putting some pressure on Southern California Edison, talking to them, continuing to have conversations with them about better segmentation for our grids. Um, I am hopeful that when we get, you know, some of the their internal data, they're required to put out the information, make it public with when they're doing power public safety power shutoffs, when weather conditions warrant them, um, when it actually happens, how long communities were de-energized. And um, I'm hopeful that the segmenting process that I've been pushing for so strong um, has made at least you know, some residents are not um, re- uh, experiencing as many public safety power shutoffs. But you're absolutely right. Yet again, on Thanksgiving, you know, thousands of families in the, um, or hundreds of families, thousands of people in the Santa Cruz Valley had no power for Thanksgiving. And we have just got to do a better job at public safety power shutoffs. Um, I also have a bill my that I was really um, was a big focus of mine. It was the um, Public Safety Power Resiliency Act, and I asked the governor for a hundred million dollars, um, and it coincided with this bill, which would have made grants available to our cities, local districts, water districts, to help mitigate the effects of public safety power shutoffs, and it passed. The Assembly unanimously, it passed the Senate unanimously, got to the governor's desk, and he vetoed it. And, you know, it was really unfortunate because it's something that, you know, our community needs, not just our community, but, you know, Southern California. And, unfortunately, it just, you know, wasn't a priority for the governor. So I am continuing. We're going to bring it up again. We're going to ask for money in the budget because it's not just our community, but a lot of other rural communities that need this funding to help with PSPF mitigation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we'll be seeing exactly what happens. Hopefully, Christmas, that will be fine. But I remember last time there were some issues where, once again, people actually had it in the same year, where both Thanksgiving and Christmas, they were entirely out of power. Yeah. Which is, that's that's ridiculous. I have my own vendetta against electronic powered <laughs> ovens and stoves. That's my own thing. But oh, man. This, this is exactly part of the reason why. Because it isn't just ovens. It isn't just the inconvenience of not being able to cook for your family or not having light. We're talking about power. So, like when um, we have some of these more rural, uh, mm-hmm. sorry, rural places, we have places where they have wells that are provided that are provide water and you have to have power for them and if you don't have that people can't have water they can't have warmth in the middle of winter and so we've seen a lot of issues due to that 
Right. Yep. And also you're cut off from everything, right? Mm-hmm. So in these rural areas, you already have trouble with internet connections because you're most likely on satellite internet. And we know all know in those rural areas, it works horrifically slow. And so you're in the middle of a fire threat with no outside communication. And it's just, you know, it really is unacceptable and not safe. Um, so it's something I continue to push. I am hopeful, though, that, you know, we just had a big winter storm. It's looking like we're going to have another big storm next week. And those moist conditions are actually really good for us because, one, we need rain, <laughs> one. But, two, um, you know, a, a lack of humidity is one of those components that um, the energy companies use to determine whether or not they should shut off power as a wildfire mitigation um, uh, indicator. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully it does last a little bit longer. However, the, the rain can kind of bring its own issues because if this is our one big rain, everything's going to grow and then immediately dry out, which I'm glad you brought up wildfire issues because people have to remember there's a reason Californians can't drive in the rain. We're constantly in a drought. We just don't get enough practice doing it. Now, you have also been working not only to help people mitigate these issues due to public safety power shutoffs, which are hopeful, which are meant theoretically to help prevent fires, but also trying to help manage fires on your own with all your other bills. Can you tell me about them a little bit? Yeah. So um, I have a bill that is currently in the state Senate. So we're going to take it up again in January. I go back. Um, we've been on uh, recess in September, September 10th, but we go back. Uh, on January 3rd. So it's the um, uh, first, it's my, um, it will be the, the second year of this legislative session. And we're going to move forward my um, CEQA exemption bill in the Senate. So what my bill does is you're absolutely right. You know, the reason why we have PSPS events is because we are not properly um, managing our wildfire uh, um, risks. And one of the things that I know right off the bat we can do um, and is really important to Santa Clarita is have a CEQA exemption for wildfire um, mitigation projects like prescribed burning, um, uh, forest management, clearing trees, and on federal land. So we are surrounded by federal forests, Angeles Federal Forest, um, Los Padres National Forest as well. And these forests need need to be managed. And there is already um, federal um, regulations that oversee those management projects. So we are duplicative in the state of California with our CEQA requirements. So if we can streamline the process and bypass CEQA because there is already environmental standards, it'll make it so much easier, um, less costly, and we will be able to um, move these projects forward quickly. And as we know, fire size season and um, weather and conditions um, happen really quickly. So the quicker we can get these projects done, the less we're going to need to actually use PSPS as a mitigation effort. And it's my bill hopefully going to be moving forward next year. And I have um, other bills and, and, you know, other projects and um, uh, resources that we're passing and moving forward in the budget as well. So it's going to be really exciting um, year for me when it comes to working on wildfire mitigation. Awesome. Well, I hope we'll see where that goes. We'll be right there with you. Now, talking about all of this, the big thing is, is that, as you mentioned, the governor vetoed your last bill. That all came down to, I'm sure at least part of it, money. Let's talk about the budget a little bit. I know you've been also working with the Problem Solvers Caucus, and I know we talked a little bit about that as well. Could you tell me about what you've been doing in terms of, like, the state budget? Yeah. So um, this year, California passed the our largest budget um, we have ever passed in our state's history. And, you know, we thought – you know, a year and a half ago that California was going to be facing a $54 billion deficit. Um, It was quite the opposite. We had upwards of an $80 billion surplus. Uh, So past the largest bill California has ever seen. I am, you know, one of the benefits actually of being in the minority is that I get to serve on more committees. I'm on 10 different committees and I'm on the budget committee. 
and I'm on the budget subcommittees that oversee education and um, oversee um, public safety. So early on, we, you know, usually um, are done with our um, budget. We're constitutionally obligated to be done by June 15th. Um, this year, we passed, you know, you know, a, a budget, and actually, I didn't vote for the overall budget because there was too much, too many loose ends um, on June 15th. But we continued to work on budget trailer bills until the last couple of days of session in September, which is absolutely, you know, crazy. Next year, we're expecting, you know, the same thing. We're expecting the governor released um, Department of Finance that we're expecting a $34 billion budget, and we're once again going to reach the GAN limit. Now, in the state of California, um, we are only allowed to um, collect revenue and taxes um, at an increase of a certain percentage of 10%. So when we surpass that, you know, um, increase, we actually have to send money back. We did that this year. We're probably going to have to do it again next year. Some of the things that, you know, I've been working on is education funding, um, ensuring that we are providing our schools the adequate, adequate resources. We increase the cost of living. Um, um, uh, we actually added what's called a COLA for our um, administrators and teachers because our, they hadn't received a raise in in quite some time. So we brought that up um, to speed in California. We're going to address that again um, next year. We have lots of money that we allocated to school districts for um, COVID uh, protection, for testing. Um, and also one of the big things that I pushed and continue to push is we know that our kids have not been in the classroom. And even our youngest learners um, who um, were not in the classroom um, have experienced a lot of learning loss. And this learning loss is not just something that is going to be made up over the course of a year or even two years. We're going to be seeing learning loss in students for the next decade. So ensuring that we're spending resources and giving districts adequate resources to spend on addressing um, the learning loss um, has been a huge priority of mine. I'm going to continue to push that next year. Uh, and obviously, you know, spending money, more money on wildfire mitigation um, through the state budget and, and being and calling for more transparency on the actual projects that are moving forward. You know, the governor had originally said that he had identified 500 projects um, that would be expedited and funded for wildfire uh, mitigation. In reality, they released that they've only identified and funded five projects absolutely unacceptable. So this year, not only are we going to be fighting for uh, the appropriate resources, but fighting for more transparency. Understandably, those are not the same number. Um, nope. <laughs> <laughs> remotely. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Suzette. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I would just like to, you know, add, I'm so thankful um, that we get to have these Monthly chats is a way to connect on what I've been doing in the district and in Sacramento. Um, it has been an amazing year, uh, an honor to represent Santa Clarita in one of the most crucial um, years in, in terms of need for strong representation and voice for our community. I do want to say that happy birthday to Santa Clarita. Today is the city's um, birthday was originally incorporated on December 15th in 1987. So happy birthday, Santa Clarita. And also congratulate again. Um, last night I attended the um, outgoing um, Bill, Mayor Bill Miranda's um, ceremony for his outgoing term as mayor. And, you know, what an amazing person. First Latino mayor in the city of Santa Clarita, truly a giant for Santa Clarita and, in, in, you know, breaking through so many barriers in his life and in our city and you know, a giant on whom I stand on his shoulders as well. So I just want to say congratulations to him again. And um, it, it has been an honor to serve our community this past year. Well, thank you so much, Suzette. Is there anything you'd like to add in terms of wishing the people of Santa Clarita happy holidays? Yes. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy, um, uh, happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. You know, get on your New Year's resolutions because next year is going to be better than this year. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us, Suzette. 
Thank you, Jay. Talk to you soon. Sounds good. And thank you for listening. You'll be able to read more about Assemblywoman Suzette Martinez Valadares and what she's been up to in Sacramento and over here in the Santa Cruz Valley over on our website at hometownstation.com or on social media at KHTS Radio.